and welcome to Arthur Chat. I'm your host, Linda D. Brown, and today my guest is D. Doyle Reynolds, and we're going to be chatting uh, with Mr. Reynolds about his new book, Shift, The Spiritist Chronicles, Book One. How are you doing, Doyle? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I am actually doing very well. Thank you so much. We've been experiencing a heat wave here in the St. Louis area, and it seems to have broken this afternoon. <laughs> I'm doing very well. Doyle, I, was, uh, I had a chance to uh, go to Amazon real quick and uh, actually uh, preview your book. You know how you can get the free um, chapters, the first a chapter or so free? Yes. Excellent book. Excellent book. So let's go ahead and get started. Why don't we start off with you telling the listeners a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, I, I uh, actually started writing, dabbling in writing, uh, as many people do when I was just a kid. I, I was just in middle school. You know, and like a lot of youngsters just starting off, I kind of dabbled with writing uh, lyrics, writing poetry, and was so, so at it, I could rhyme real well. But... Uh, <laughs> Nothing stellar. And then through the uh, years, I kind of found my footing in uh, what I like to do. And I, I kind of started writing um, short stories and novels. And then uh, well, from there, I had an opportunity to take some classes in screenwriting. And I, I got a pretty good, pretty good gig in screenwriting. And I was, uh, I've actually had five screenplays at one time or another under option. None of them ever hit the big screen, which is which is very common. Um, lots of green lights to go through before a, a screenplay will actually get shot and uh, make it to the big screen. So I was kind of disappointed the way things worked out, and my wife uh, said, you know, why don't you go back to where you started? When we first met, you told me you really wanted to write books. Why don't you just go back to that and eliminate all those little men in between? And uh, so I started thinking about, it. well, you know, I, I do have a few good ideas that, I, you know, I've been rattling around my head for a while, and and uh, the end result of uh, of all of that labor of, of love was shift. And so, um, you know, it is what it is. It, it kind of, I, I thought I knew where I wanted it to go, and as frequently is the case when you're populating your, your story with uh, good characters. They kind of took on a life of their own, and it took me off in kind of some unexpected directions. A lot of it I'm kind of surprised at where it ended up as well, but it's, it's been a labor of love, and it's been fun, and, and uh, be the first of many. I'm working on the second now, but uh, uh, it's, it's, I've been really enjoying it. I live here in uh, East Tennessee. I recently moved from Nevada. My whole family moved out here. It was quite a journey about 2,500 miles across the country, and uh, we love it here. We love it here. It's not the it's not the desert. Nothing against you folks out there who who love the desert, but um, I'm I'm really I'm really liking the hills. I'm liking the trees, four seasons, and fireflies, and uh, the kids are really excited. So not much not much more to it than that. I uh, I tend to write things from a Christian worldview perspective. One of the screenplays I worked on, for instance, was uh, it was kind of thrown at me from a production company. They wanted a vampire script. So from a Christian worldview, I started thinking about, well, what would it be like to be a Christian and dwelt by the Holy Spirit being bit by a vampire? What would that reaction be on, on, a, on a vampire? Probably, probably not good. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote a screenplay that was kind of going off in that direction. So you know, I, I I take a lot of that with me. You know, a lot of the spiritual warfare stuff and and the Christian worldview, and it goes into my writing. It it just does because that's kind of my nature as well. Absolutely. Uh, and it's, uh, I think I mentioned to you and for our listeners out there, I actually met Doyle on a Facebook. Web, Christian uh, Facebook. paranormal fiction. Yeah, from Facebook. A bunch of Absolutely. great people there. <laughs> oh yeah, we have to give a, a lot, shout out. A lot of, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, to those folks there. Yeah, there's a lot of good folks there, and and you and you never know what they're going to end up saying or writing, and uh, some some funny people Absolutely. out there, some serious people out there, but they're all wonderful people. Mm -hmm. And again, let's give a shout out to the uh, coordinator of that group. She does a fantastic job. A, a fabulous place to throw wild ideas, to brainstorm a little bit. Um, 
uh, Doyle, it's amazing that we, believe it or not, we actually write uh, pretty much the same thing. We're definitely in the same genre. And when I got I a chance to that. read, yeah, did you see that? It's even scary because your character in this book is the exact same. Well, the initials are the same, different different sex because you have a female, uh, Cassie, that you call CJ in this book. Is that correct? Right, right. Okay. Well, in my second book, my character's name is Claude Junior, and I call him CJ. <laughs> No kidding. Isn't that something? Yeah, that's really amazing. And I also uh, have a lot of uh, demons and angels in my book. So it's just amazing. It, it, I, I'm like you. I, you know, I, I'm a big, I'm a Christian, and I really believe that God is calling us because I started writing at a very young age, and then of course got away from it as life took on, you know, its own little <laughs> detours there. But uh, it's uh-huh. amazing how he, you know, I think that we're now. Uh, coming back uh, as we as we've matured and we're writing about things that I think will really be a great a great testimony to the kingdom. Uh, I really recommend. We're going to talk a little bit more about your book. I highly recommend that our listeners uh, get a copy of your book, download it on your Kindle, get the paperback. It is a fabulous book. I got hooked just on the first couple of pages that I was reading. <laughs> So, well, thank uh, you, and I appreciate that. Oh, oh, sure. Tell us a little bit about the book. How did you come up with the plot for this particular book? Well, I, I've liked stories where, you know, the, the innocence of little kids and how malleable children's uh, minds are, how open they are toward eternal things. You you tell a kid about God, and they'll say, yeah, sure. You know, and they're, they're so accepting and so believing. Now, granted, you'll tell them about the Easter Bunny, and they'll say, yeah, sure about that, too, and Santa Claus and everything else. But what I really like is that they're savvy, and they have eyes wide open, and they're so innocent. I've always been drawn to stories like that, where you've got something extraordinary happening with this child. And in this particular case, Cassie has his hand on her, and she doesn't know why, nobody knows exactly why. As she has some special abilities that come out in, in the book that uh, are pretty extraordinary. And then it, by the time it wraps up in, this, in the end of the book, we find out that she's the right person in the right place at the right time to solve this problem. Very often as adults, as, as adults we kind of get jaded and we get focused on life and, and the here and now and we lose sight of spiritual things. And there's spiritual things going on all around us constantly, whether we recognize it or not, it's there. Kids know it, animals know it. I mean, have you ever been into a room or seen a situation where an animal's freaking out and staring off into the corner and it sees something or perceives something that we're not recognizing because our eyes, our eyes are closed? Kids and animals are very perceptive. I think we all realize this. Not every single child and not, and not every single animal, but by and large, more perceptive than uh, most adults are. And so... No, I- absolutely agree with that. I just thought, well, it would make sense that, you know, and a child shall lead them. God would take okay. somebody who's not going to be distracted and is going to be able to stay focused on uh, the road that she, journey that she began um, without the distractions of the world as much as an adult would. And I, so I, I kind of had fun with that. And she's extraordinary. She's a little bit of a, she's advanced for her age. She's six years old, but she likes to read grown-up books. She likes to read Dickens in the beginning of this book, and that's not something every child's going to do, although I've known a couple who are pretty bright in that way, and she was just kind of uh, hand-selected by God for this extraordinary journey, and what happens is is, uh, a military experiment throws this small coastal community of Ventura into this kind of uh, an in-between world. Um, Something something really goes awry with uh, an experiment. Think of for instance, the Philadelphia experiment, if I can put it to it. It's kind of like, it's one of my friends put it, well, it's kind of like the Philadelphia experiment meets this present darkness. Exactly. So you end up with this cross exactly. over spiritual beings walking down parts of the town of Ventura, and it's it's been blackened by this big storm, this uh, darkness that's raging and lightning punctuating it, and these people are trying to survive there with all of these spiritual beings including angels. So there's spiritual warfare literally going on around them. And as we are, whether we realize it or not, in our current reality that we live in, they're kind of the center of this spiritual battle um, in their neighborhood. And Cassie has a big role in that. And uh, so it's kind of a mix of just some military type of 
conspiracy stuff in there. There's a little bit of science fiction. There's a little bit of horror and thriller. There's a, a fair amount of humor. I can't help it. I've I've got a funny bone, and I can't help but get humor in my stories. Absolutely. And uh, I think I remember had um, posted on our Facebook group. So I am a huge fan of Smash Words. My problem is I <laughs> I'm so busy. I don't have the time to really. Um, figure out how to set up my format for that. So, but the great thing about Mark Coker, who is the founder of Smashwords, for you listeners out there that are interested yes. in uh, self-publishing and using Smashwords, he has a great free style guide for you guys to use. So you can download it for free, and it shows you how to do yes. it. And if you're like me and you just don't have the time, he also has a list of people, of authors, that will actually do it for you at a very minimum charge. Have you had a chance to check that out, uh, Doyle? Yes, I have. Yeah, there, there's some people, folks out there available too to help with uh, artwork for your um, book covers, things like that. And I happen to do mine myself because I've been dabbling with graphics forever, composite photography and so forth. And the little girl on the cover actually is, um, I recently remade it, but it's uh, kind of a silhouette of my uh, eldest daughter, Emma. And oh, okay. um, she's, the in, she's the inspiration for that. I know that on his side, he's got lots of helpful people that help you with your book covers, your formatting, editing. Uh, Mark has got quite a nice bit of machinery there with Smashwords. And through Absolutely. Smashwords, your your book will end up on uh, at Barnes & Noble's website, Apple, for your iPad and iPhone. As my book's available on those as well. Diesel, uh, Scroll Motion, and I don't know, he's got a couple of those going on. I think for, gosh, I know there's a couple more I'm missing. He's, he's got quite a distribution machine. He's working on uh, a deal right now with Amazon, from what I understand, to marry their technology to where you publish through Smashwords and it'll go automatically through uh, Amazon as well. But now Amazon, did. They've got a good thing going, too, because if you go through Create Space, you can publish the hardbound or a paperback version, whatever, of your book for really reasonably priced. Right. Um, I was going to ask because, you about that. Yeah. Tell us about yeah. your experience with Create Space. It was so simple. I mean, I just followed the directions on uh, you know how to format the book and what size the uh, JPEG image needed to be for the cover and what the back needed to be, you know, and it's drag and drop. This photo here, grab, drag and drop this image there, you know, uh, browse to the image after you've made it and send it up. And, um, boy, it was, it, was just, it was really simple. Um, they help you get set up with your, uh, you know, your ISBN number, and, and it's a different one than what you use for Smashwords. So it's, it was a good experience. I, uh, I never thought I would do it because... You know, you go through these writing classes, and what you hear is, you know, if you ever publish or put something on the Internet or do anything otherwise public, um, then the major publishers won't touch you. And then, uh, of course, the agents won't touch you. If the publishers won't touch you because, you know, you're taking food from their mouth, why would they mess with you? And on and on. And um, I, so I was going to go traditional for the longest time, mm -hmm. and I actually had several query letters out there. And then orders with their bankruptcy happened, and I started reading the news articles and listening to the chit-chat out there. Hundreds of millions of dollars owed to authors that, that from borders that publishers are going to have to cover. So what does this mean? You, know, you follow the money always when you see mm -hmm. how things are going to go down. You follow the money and you say, okay, well, if the publishers are having to dig into back into their reserves to make good on um, bad borders deals, then that kind of leaves us newer writers out in the cold for a little bit till they get caught up and get flush again, especially in this economy. Mm -hmm, so in exactly. even best case, even if I if I signed a contract tomorrow with a major publisher, it could be easily a year and a half to two years before my book ever sees the light of day anyway. And I thought, you know, I'm not gonna wait. Maybe a publisher will jump on and really like my book and get behind it and now I'll have to mess around with this self promotion stuff and all this dirty work that I don't like to you know, play with. You know, I just maybe I'm lazy, I don't know. I'd rather somebody did it all for me like these traditional publishers are supposed to do. I, I know that's not the case. I know you have to self promote with them too. Yeah, but you know I'm laughing. Yeah, because my first book <laughs> I went through the traditional publisher and guess what? 
I did all the marketing myself. So unless you're a John Grisham or James Patterson, you're still going to be doing a, a majority of the uh, marketing. <laughs> exactly. Well, it was just another great thing about, about Smashwords. You don't even have to publish before you put all your information on there. You can dabble with it and put the numbers on there and see what it looks like. And then uh, in the end, you can say, okay, I'm going to set my price, and it'll tell you, okay, well, this is what your margin will be. And mm -hmm. it's, it's exactly. better than what you'll probably get from a traditional publisher because they keep the lion's share of the money. And, and, I'm, and I'm nodding not. on that as well, absolutely. My royalties from my traditional publish, publisher was just laughable compared to what I do, self-publishing and, and getting my books, you know, purchasing. People that buy my books directly from me or right off my website or from Amazon. I, I agree, and every time I get a, a publisher's compensation check. <laughs> or yeah, I'm deposit, sure. Which I'm sure. I have, yeah. Yeah, wow. Uh, I agree. Mark, um, Mark Poker's got a good, he's got a good machinery, bit of machinery going yes, over there. Yes. I applaud him for his efforts and looking out for us. Absolutely. I'm we'll excited to see Shout out Mark Poker for, fast, for smash words, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Doyle, you mentioned something um, that, that, and I think I kind of, uh, you touched on it on Facebook, and I sent a response back, and I'd really like to kind of chit-chat about it. Uh, before we move on, you okay. said that you had optioned out a couple of books before, but they were never made into movies. Uh, actually, screenplays. They weren't were books. They were screenplays. Right. Okay. And uh, what, now, what, uh, uh, what I did is I, I, mean, I, I had several screenplays, and then I started working for a small production company, and they kind of grabbed me, and they grabbed my screenplays, and they paid me some options because they had some seed money, and the plan was to make them into uh, films, and it's an interesting process, and in that process, we learned the studio method, which kind of in a very short Reader's Digest version is you get attachments. You don't go out and say, well, I need, I want to make a movie. Can you, you know, investors, can you give me $200,000 and I want to make a movie? And that, this is what's so disappointing for me sometimes that with uh, Christian movies is they go the hard way. They go to a bank or they get traditional lending and they get $2 million. They go, okay, I got $2 million. I can't do much with it, but we can make a cheesy version of the movie. And it, it ends up, sadly, most of the time turning out really poorly. When What I learned is the studio method is it's all about attachments, bankable attachments. You get a little bit of money to secure those people like you do earnest money um, on a home. You want a really good director, you say, uh, hey, I've got this script, would you look at it and consider doing it? Well, when you find a really good A-list director or an A-list actor or actress, what have you, to read it and they say, yeah, I'd, I'd jump on, you know, um, provided you get you know, a good director and blah, 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 and with final approval, and you say, sure, and you get this contract, you get them to sign it and agree to it, and you give them a little bit of earnest money so you kind of have them on retainer. So then you have, say, it's Jack Nicholson. And so then you got Jack Nicholson, and you say, you go to a director and you say, hey, I got this really cool script I'd like you to look at and consider directing it. Jack Nicholson's already signed on. Would you like to take a look at it? Sure. Who wouldn't want to direct Jack Nicholson? So now you get a director and you get... Jack Nicholson, and you get distribution to Warner or whoever, and then you start adding people on like that, and you kind of, that's how they're all bankable, and you kind of stack this paperwork out. Meanwhile, you're paying out a couple thousand bucks here, five thousand bucks there, as opposed to trying to raise just two million to shoot the whole movie. So you get good A-list talent, and when you get distribution, you get enough money um, through conventional, traditional lending, if you will, with, with banks other lending institutions that do film lending. Uh, sometimes if you look at executive producer credits, you'll see that people have signed on to uh, bankroll a, a, a portion of that movie. And um, I'm, I'm skipping a couple steps here in between, but just for the sake of brevity here. So you have all this bankable talent, and you get money funded, and you get your distribution, and that's how you, make, you get enough of a budget to make a really big blockbuster movie and do it and do it right. And... Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, this was all right before 9-11. Uh, we had a, a, um, a bunch of investors ready to jump and some projects in the hopper and all kinds of wonderful things happening. And then 9-11 happened and the phones quit ringing. People were really unsure of what was going to go on with the economy. And then one month went by, another month went by. We ended up in 2002. And next thing you know, I found myself getting laid off and things started shutting down here and there. So it's kind of a disappointing, but, uh, you know, that's life. You take it and you go and you move on. 
Now, hopefully you still have the rights to everything that you were a part of, you know, writing the screen the screenplay on, is that correct? Sure. Sure. When you oh. when you when you option something when you option something, they're kind of renting it for a season. Very often it's a exactly. year. And if they figure mm-hmm. if they can't get the big funding for it that they want within that year, then it reverts back to you. Um, the, a good thing to look for when you're doing that kind of a deal is you want first option. If you're interested in writing the screenplay, you're looking for first option. Also, with traditional publishing houses, you want to look for that too if you'd like to take a crack at writing the screenplay. Right. Well, you, you know, you were in good company because you mentioned um, Frank Peretti uh, and his novels, uh, this, this Present Darkness and this Piercing the Darkness, two of my favorite novels. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of it or not, but, you know, his his movies, his books were also optioned, and they were never made into movies. Well, so. interestingly enough, one of the one of the people who was going to produce that, a former um, Empire Strikes Back fan, um, Howard Kazanjian, had the pleasure of, of meeting him when I was with that production company quite a while back. Okay. And um, they were very disappointed because they, they got this, they initially made all kinds of mistakes. They got this worldly director involved who didn't care so much about the spiritual message. He wanted the effects and so forth. And from what I understand from Howard Kazanjian is that uh, Frank Freddy was very disappointed that when they went in to take a look at what they were doing with the graphics department, the demons and all that stuff looked really cool and the angels and so forth looked really cheesy. And mm-hmm. it was taking a nasty turn that he didn't care for. So there was I don't know if there was any actual litigation or if it just let things fall however which way they did, but it fell apart, sadly enough. Um, right. I believe it was going to be made through Fox, I think, one of the Fox um, branches. I'm not sure which division, but it's disappointing, but that's the kind of spiritual warfare that happens around us all the time where you try to do something and, and get the message out there. Can I, do I have time to share one of my favorite Bible stories? You sure do. Go ahead. Um one of my favorite stories, I believe it's Daniel chapter 9 on this subject, where Daniel is praying and praying and, and wondering why the Lord isn't answering and he hasn't heard anything back yet. Um, this is really shorthand. Forgive me, Lord. Uh, and um, <laughs> by and by, the angel finally came down and, and said basically, gee, sorry it was late. You know, I've got an answer to you from God. But I was delayed by the prince of Persia. And Michael had to come down and uh, rescue me. So here's this angel coming saying, you know, I have the answer to your prayer directly from God's lips, Daniel, but the prince of Persia, who is a, a major demon, evidently they're territorial, and he was over what is now modern Iran, and he was preventing Daniel's angel from getting the message. And finally Michael had to step in. Michael himself had to step in and take care of the prince of Persia so that this angel could complete his journey down and talk to Daniel. So we don't know always what's going on behind the scenes. That's what we need to pray in faith and just trust the Lord that if he wants to get something done, he'll get it done, and that nothing can stop it. But there are forces of darkness, and we need to watch the things we play with in this world, the things we watch, the things we do, things we dabble in, because there are consequences to everything. There are doorways that open everything. Everybody probably has an Ouija, a Ouija board story that's just know, horrific. Yeah. And that stuff is nothing to mess with, especially as Christians. We don't want to mess with it either. I mean, yes, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. But, you know, if you do that, you're opening the door, and the Lord almost kind of hands off just to allow you to get your tail kicked a little bit so that you learn your lesson. He's not going to ever let go of you. You're always in his grasp. But, boy, you just don't want to mess with this stuff. People exactly. who don't know the Lord, and, and, there has been possession. Exactly. And, Doyle, you, you really touched on exactly what my first book, that's exactly what that's about. You know, uh, people that are doing the tarot cards, the spirit guides, they have no clue what kind of dem- uh, demonic realm they're opening up. Well, listen, I have truly enjoyed We're down to, like, 20 seconds. I have truly enjoyed um uh, chit chatting with you on the uh, on Arthur Chat. You are a fantastic guest. Would love to have Thank you. you. Back I enjoyed here. it too. Uh, oh, absolutely. And, you know, we need maybe uh, once I get you know get book two situated and everything, and, and take a couple of months off from writing and just concentrate on this show. <laughs> I would love to get you back on here. We could talk about spiritual for- warfare because. What you quoted from Daniel, oh, oh my goodness, the God had brought that to me at so many times and just reminded me, no, didn't, what is it, um, de- delay does not necessarily mean denied. It can always right. be delayed because of the, the demonic spirits that are trying to stop us from walking in the, in the promise and the blessings of the Lord. I have ran, 
well, I, I'm sure you ran into it too since you write about spiritual warfare, but that I just can't believe yes. you quoted that one. That is truly one of my favorites. That one and also the story about Daniel interpreting the handwriting on the wall, that's, yes. <laughs> that's also a classic. I really like that. But, uh, many, many, many people of Parsons. Absolutely right. Thank you so much <laughs> for coming on the air. I really enjoyed it. You keep writing once you uh, get book two because I see this is going to be a series. Uh, do you know yes. right off the top of your head how many books you're going to do for this series? You know, I don't know. I don't want to box myself in. I tried to do that with my first book, and it took off on its own, so uh, that's useless. Uh, and I was thinking three or four books, but, you know, okay. you never know what like happens. They, <laughs> absolutely. They do take on a life of their own, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, well, thank you. You enjoy the rest of the weekend. Again, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, you make sure you let me know on Facebook when book two is ready. We'll get you back on here. Absolutely. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, listeners, for uh, tuning in. Exactly. You have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.